<clears throat> Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, call to order the City Council, the Library Board, the Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency regular meeting of Thursday, May 21, 2015. I'd like to ask uh, the Mayor Pro Tem if he would lead us in the flag salute, please. We have roll call, please. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wild? Here. Council Member Smotrich? Here. And Mayor Hobart? Here. <clears throat> Before we get into our first presentation uh, with Scott White, uh, the President of the and C, uh, CEO of the CVP, <clears throat> I thought it was, I saw something in the Dilbert column uh, a couple days ago that I thought. Uh, was good to keep us from taking things too seriously when uh, uh, sometimes we do. Uh, Dilbert is talking to uh, Dogbert, the guy sitting on the table on, on the desk next to him. And Dogbert says to Dilbert, as you head to your horrible job, remember these inspirational words. In the long run, we're all dead. Dilbert responds, that feels like an oversimplification. Dogbert replies, I skipped the part where you suffer for 90 years. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, onward and upward, and we're now ready to do a um, presentation uh, by Scott White uh, of the uh, <clears throat> Greater Palm Springs Convention and Visitors Bureau regarding potential economic impact of the Salton Sea on the Greater Palm Springs Tourism Industry. Good afternoon, Mayor and yeah, the Council. It's a pleasure to be here today. And your staff, it's, um, it's a great honor to work with the City of Rancho Mirage. Um, this is a very important topic, and um, we think there's some great opportunity that can come out of all of this. So, if you recall, September 10th, 2012, um, there was a foul order, odor that came from the Salton Sea. And um, I think the one good thing that happened that day is it reached all the way to Los Angeles and Ventura County, prompting a lot of phone calls to, uh, ironically, 911 and the local water agencies and the sewer companies and trying to figure out where did that smell come from. Um, and it was uh, clear, we knew, all knew where it came from as we've lived with this for many years, uh, for a long time. And it did shine a spotlight on the fact that we have this uh, great opportunity, I like to look at it, before us that we can't seem to find a resolution to this. And um, as a tourism industry, as we represent the tourism industry for the Coachella Valley, we felt that it was important to shed some light um, to all of our elected officials, both here locally, but also in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. as well, that um, uh, their, um, their delay could only inevitably affect all of us in terms of quality of life and also the impact uh, in terms of revenues to our destination. And so uh, just a real quick snippet for those that maybe aren't familiar with the tourism industry. It's the number one industry in the Coachella Valley. It supports uh, indirectly and directly over 46,000 jobs, uh, generates over 12 million people each year to the valley, over 5.8 billion in sales, um, $486 million in taxes locally and state, 372 million in federal taxes. And when we did this economic impact study, which we've now done twice, we've done it both in 2011 and 13, and we'll do it again in 15, we hired a firm uh, uh, called Oxford Economics, which is a global firm. They have a division within their corporation called Tourism Economics, and they understand our business, and they're highly regarded throughout the U.S. and even around the world as well. We asked them, had tourism or does tourism not exist or does not exist at the level that it does today, what would be the impact to each household? And for us to maintain the quality of life that we have and the services that we receive, each household would have to contribute up to $3,200 in additional taxes each year. Now, that's if tourism goes away, which we know won't happen. But with issues that we've impacted in the past from the Salton Sea, both from the airborne dust and also from the smell, that could impact our destination, which would 
prevent individuals from choosing our destination for a vacation, to get away, to buy real estate, and so on. Um, so we have to assume some low impacts and some high impacts, because we really don't know what's going to happen over the next 5, 10, 15 years. There's all kinds of a different opinions. And so Adam and Tourism Economics, when they did this, they really looked at it from various different um, scenarios. And they had to look at it also from other opportunities and case studies around the world. The, the Gulf oil spill uh, that happened with B, B and P, uh, BP, um, earthquakes, tsunamis, um, red tides, whatever it may be. And, and when they looked at it, they looked at it. What was the impact in the short term to those destinations? What was the impact in the long term? What were the public relations perceptions? What did it take for a destination to recover from that? How long did it take? And as we all know, with the uh, the world of social media between Facebook and Twitter and everything else, uh, a lot of those facts and information can be distorted. And it becomes very difficult for an organization such as ourselves or a destination for us to get our hands around that, which is going to take a lot of money and time and effort to hire firms and resources to combat that misinformation and try to control the, the, uh, the outcomes from that. So the study you have or you should have in front of you is this document here, which is the potential economic impact of the Salton Sea on the tourism industry. And I'm, I'm going to read a few facts. We won't go through everything because we could be here for a long time. But it was interesting when they looked at the study over a five year period, um, they estimated that we could lose anywhere from 3 million on the low side up to 16 million on the high side over that five year period. Now that's an aggregate number. So if you figure 12 million a year, uh, how does that break out annually? Uh, it's quite a bit. So if you look at total spending, total spending loss to the destination is 1.3 billion to a maximum or a height of 6.5 billion. Could be more, could be less. But again, these are averages that they're giving us. Losses in taxes, both at the state and local level, 142 million on the low side, which is still a lot of money, to 712 million on the high side. And the federal loss, and this is gonna be important, I think, as our elected officials talk to Sacramento and, and the federal government and so forth, as we try to find the solution that if, if you don't do anything, you're gonna lose these revenues, because I know everybody right, everybody right now is looking at how do we fix the Salton Sea and what is the right answer. Uh, the federal loss would be 109 million to 545 million. Um, the, the thing about the Salton Sea is it's, it's not going to discriminate. So our industry, yes, will be highly impacted, but we feel like the uh, economic development uh, agencies would be impacted, obviously. The real estate community would be impacted. The country clubs would be impacted. Nobody's going to want to come here if they don't know they're going to come out for a weekend and be um, uh, hit with a smell or these dust storms that could be potentially harmful to us. Um, so we also did a little bit of research into, and having prior uh, to be uh, living here, I was in San Antonio. And in South Texas, um, it's globally known for bird watching. And uh, I've been in the industry for a long time, but I really didn't know a lot about bird watching. And it's an incredible impact to the economy to South Texas. Hundreds of millions of dollars, thousands of people come from all over the world um, to find these rare birds and to have this experience um, that can be second to none. And so as we looked through this, we really looked at the opportunity, can the Salton Sea really be turned into an economic driver, which we think it could be, for things like bird watching and outdoor recreation, kayaking, and so forth. And that generates billions of dollars in the state of California. We'd love to have a, a piece of that market share. We also embarked, um, this was brought up, I guess, about a year and a half ago or so, that um, we should have a license plate that's dedicated to the Salton Sea. So we have this beautiful plate here, and uh, Save Our Sea is a, um, is a placeholder for that. But the drawing, which is a pelican at the Salton Sea, was done by a high, local high school student, uh, which was, we're excited to have that happen. But in order to make this reality, we have to have 7,500 people sign up for the plate and pay the fee before it will go into production. So we still have a little bit of work to do. So we've placed some of these, and we're doing a campaign right now. I've got some outside for those if you'd like to sign up, and all of you have got one. I've already signed up. Uh, unfortunately, we have to do this the old-fashioned way for right now. Uh, they won't take credit cards. So we actually got to print the form, fill it out, put in your check, and mail it. We'd be happy to mail it for you. So anybody that wants to come to the CVB and drop them off, we'll mail it for you. What's, um, a, what's a check? The check is $50. No, what, okay. is, what is a check? What is a check, exactly. <laughs> so um, it's a difficult one. So we're working on that. We're still trying to figure out a way that we can get around Sacramento to use a credit card system of some kind. But right now, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is not set up for that, and um, I know Steve's worked on this a little bit with us as well, and we're still trying to continue to, to work on it. But in the interim, find your checkbook, dust it off. Hopefully you can uh, do this. It'll, 
It won't change your license plate. So the numbers you have today would stay the same. You would just get this beautiful plate that says Save Our Salt and Sea. Some of the proceeds would go directly to that, to wetlands restoration and so forth that the Department of Fish and Wildlife could uh, entertain. If you've got a personalized plate, it's $98. And if you've got just a generic plate, it's $50. So we're encouraging everybody. We're doing a, uh, a nice social campaign. Uh, we're going to have some of the cities maybe do some competitions to try to get who get the most uh, residents to sign up for this. And we're, we've actually um, we're working with an intern, a student that used to live in the valley, whose uh, environmental science is her background. She's now at San Luis Obispo uh, Cal Poly. She's going to work on this for over the summertime, getting some social media out, try to get some of the youth involved as well, and see if we can meet the number of about 7,500 people to sign up, pay, and then once that happens, and then they would get their plate next year. So we're hopeful for that. So with that, that's my presentation on the on the Salton Sea. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, or um, I didn't bring any Dilbert jokes along, but next time I'll become better prepared. <laughs> any questions? Dana, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Scott, uh, we know what the problem is. How can the city of Ranch Mirage really have an impact on what's going on at the Salton Sea, other than the, the raising money that way? We're at the other end of the valley. We're not directly impacted as much as Indio or Coachella is. So what can Palm Springs and and Rancho Mirage and the cities at this end of the valley do? Well, I think you could pass a resolution, perhaps, to send a message to uh, Sacramento, to the governor. Uh, some of the issues are that they've agreed to, uh, when they did the Water Quantification Act, they agreed to mitigate, m mitigate this problem. And uh, it just seems to not, it gets stuck in that kind of cog there. So letters, resolutions to Sacramento letting them know that this study was done, that tourism is an important component of Rancho Mirage. Um, what the impact could be. I think the more cities that we can have write and uh, communicate with Sacramento and our, our, our uh, Congressman Ruiz as well to let them know this is an important topic for us and for the city of Rancho Mirage and we'd like you to try to expedite the process as much as possible. I, I think that's really all we can ask for at this time. Um, we're hopeful. I think it's been talked a lot uh, about uh, publicly but we still haven't seen any quite the right solutions. And unfortunately, I think, I don't know, five or six years ago, somebody came up with a solution that was $9 billion, and that's been the headlines, that it's a $9 billion uh, solution, and I don't think that that's the case. It really is going to take uh, multiple solutions. As an example, geothermal, one of the larger geothermal deposits in the country, I think, and could really uh, have great benefits to Southern California. Geothermal really has tried at Sacramento to get the right legislation in place to make it a fair playing field for them to be able to get the energy out effectively and efficiently, but that takes some revenues as well. So if that can become more of an ideal location for geothermal, that's going to help the Salton Sea. Uh, same thing with biofuels. We had a presentation by a, a biofuel company that was in San Diego that would love to do it at the Salton Sea, but they ended up going to New Mexico and Arizona because legislation is much easier to do business there. Uh, but they would much prefer to be here. It's ripe for biofuel and algae ponds and so forth, lithium. So it's going to take all of those different avenues to, to affect um, the solution to that. And with that, those funds could be raised to then, the talk has been dividing the lake in half. The northern lake, which would be closer to us, uh, Salton Sea, could be then designed for wetlands, for camping, for activities and so forth. If you go back to the 1950s and 60s, people were water skiing, if you look at the pictures out there in the yacht club and so forth. And, uh, we think that there's an opportunity to maybe get close to that. Who knows? Uh, we have to kind of think positive, but at least have an opportunity that we can prevent the smell. It's an important flyway for the birds as well from North America going to Mexico, so that's an important component as well. Um, so there's more positives and negatives that could come out of this, but we just need more people to put pressure on Governor Brown, Sacramento, uh, Washington, D.C. to get this resolved before it does become a, a major catastrophe for our destination. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Randy, will we be able to uh, put together a resolution uh, sure. in the next uh, week or so? Absolutely. Put it on your next calendar. Great. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, any, Scott, any the, other uh, questions? Yeah. The, uh, of course, the frustration, as you know, and I know you hear this all the time, is that the only thing that comes out of whether it's Washington or Sacramento is another study. Yeah. Uh, another study group. And that, of course, we're probably up to our umpteenth study, yeah. and that's the major frustration. And uh, uh, I, for one, and by the way, count me in on the license plate. You just Thank picked you. up 50 bucks here. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it's been, you know, it's been a great frustration for a lot of people. We know that it could be an incredible 
tourist yeah. attraction, and I know that you're working hard uh, because that really is your end of the deal. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. I think I think the the more um, cities and elected officials and residents that could put pressure on Sacramento is going to help our cause. I think, as we know, the 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 ones that that are the loudest in Sacramento sometimes always get the most attention. So we just need to be a little louder. Um, that we're tired of the studies and it's time to move on to something that's going to be more effective. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank Thanks. you very much. Next on the agenda is a uh, status report from Ken Stevens regarding Vertec. Hi, good afternoon. All right. Yeah, Ken Stevens with Burtech. Uh, this is our first quarter waste and recycling report uh, for 2015. Next. You might remember AB 341 uh, <clears throat> requires that most commercial customers and multi-residential units subscribe to either recycling service through us, through or through their trash company, or have some sort of internal recycling program. This chart up on the wall here will tell you that, um, that back in March of last year, our commercial compliance was at about 89%, um, and our multifamily was hovering around uh, 87%. Uh, March of this year, um, commercial went up to 94%, and uh, re uh, multifamily residential up to almost 90%. Um, as of last month, our commercial is up to 95%, so we're getting some cooperation there. All right, next slide. Okay, what I'm going to do in the effort of keeping this brief, I'm gonna just kind of go over our first quarter highlights, and then I'm gonna touch on just a couple of these items in a little bit further detail. In the first quarter, we submitted the following reports, the ones you see up there, um, about six um, required reports through our contract. Um, I worked with the ANA Inspiration and Gary Calhoun to co coordinate waste and recycling um, collection before, during, and after the event. We worked with the Risk Carlton um, Engineering Department to reduce contamination in their recycle bins. Next slide. Worked with BBs at the River to begin food waste collection introduced commercial recycling to Western Dermatology and the Valero gas station on Highway 111, uh, developed a letter with the help of Randy Viegas and Bruce Harry to introduce the requirements of AB 1826 to food waste producers. That went out uh, sometime in January. Um, planned the spring waste characterizations and um, did recycling presentations to several HOAs. Um, next slide. Okay, one, the last two items are what I'm going to cover in a little bit, de a little bit of detail here. Um, what are waste characterizations? <clears throat> Excuse me. I've mentioned this in the last couple of uh, presentations, but I've never gone into it in detail. These are performed each spring and autumn. What we do is we take random samples from commercial and residential recycling loads, allowing us to identify contaminants and the approximate areas they come from. That process enables us to address contamination issues with our customers. In other words, we can often tell when we go through a load um, where the material comes from, because sometimes you find junk mail and things that identify the customer. And it also allows us to ascertain what materials are recyclable and which recyclable and which are not at our recycling center, um, because that list of recyclable items is growing all the time. So something that may not have been recyclable last year might be recyclable this year. So if we find something in the load that's questionable, then we can bring it up to our processing centers. Next slide. Recycling presentations um, were given to Mission Shores, Blue Skies, and the Colony HOAs. Um, these presentations um, usually are done for about 30 to 50 residents, um, as well as the HOA board. Um, we cover special services available to residents, um, some of which they may not be aware of. Um, and at each of these presentations, we've been proud to distribute the new recycle wheel that was, if you'll remember, that was updated earlier this year, or maybe the end of last year. But we've gotten that updated uh, wheel available now. Next slide. We explain the state diversion, diversion requirements and how residential recycling efforts affect the, those goals. Because I think if, you, if the residents understand why we're doing it, I think it probably pushes them toward greater participation. 
The presentation features a two minute video of where recyclables go once they leave the customer's home. And this is kind of showing them how it goes through our recycling center and how the materials are processed. Next. We also identify um, free services available to Rancho Mirage residents. Again, some things maybe some of the residents weren't aware of. We go over the bulky item pickup, the document shredding, the e-waste collection, the HHW collection, and the prescription drug disposal program. So um, these are just a few of the items, but the, the biggest part that I enjoy most about these residential presentations is the Q&A at the end, because I get some really good questions. I mean, even some stuff that makes me think. So it's, um, so I think it's beneficial to both the resident and to me to do those. All right, well, that's all I had for today. Um, any questions? Thank you, thank you Ken, very much. You all have right. our best to uh, the Burtech team. We appreciate the update very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> We're going to move an item, uh, number eight, I think. Let me double check. Yeah, we're going to move number eight up till right now. So this will be the item, consideration of designating the home at 71475 K Ballard Lane as an historic resource. Dana? Yeah. Also, do we have to add a supplemental agenda item to the calendar? Um, I'll do that in a moment. I'm going to do it after we finish with okay. this. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, where do we go with this, uh, Randy? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Britt Wilson will handle this. Britt? Uh, thank you, Mr. Biner. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council. The uh, subject property is located on the south side of Kay Ballard Lane. It was built in 1955 and is owned by Miss Kay Ballard, who I note is in the audience today. Should you care to hear from her? Uh, she is a, a Hollywood personality and an actress and a singer. The architect is unknown, but the home was reportedly built for Desi Arnaz, another Hollywood personality. And Miss Ballard reports that she bought the home from Desi Arnaz and that he lived in the home for several years and uh, told us great tales of many Hollywood star stars coming and going to the house. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission toured this residence back on December 9th of 2014, and although they saw no architectural merit, they did, uh, they certainly did recognize the Hollywood connection of Desi Arnaz and Kay Ballard, which qualifies the property under the criteria of being associated with persons that have made a meaningful contribution to the city. So to that end, the commission asked staff to go ahead and proceed and, and get this uh, for a public hearing before that body which we did, uh, and that was held on April 14th. One resident did send in a letter that's attached to your packet, uh, objecting that nomination, uh, appearing to be citing architectural issues and uh, questioning whether or not uh, Desi Arnaz lived in that house or whether or not she had the house that was Desi's. We, uh, staff and the chairwoman of the Historic Preservation Commission were able to obtain several published articles as well as Miss. Ballard's testimony that seemed to bear out the fact that Desi Arnaz did indeed own that home and, and live there and that Kay bought it from him. The uh, criteria as previously mentioned for this is again not an architectural merit. It is based on that it's associated with persons or events that have made a meaningful contribution to the city uh, and we feel that that with Desi Arnaz and Kay Ballard that it meets that criteria. The city's municipal code does require staff to determine the national register eligibility of this, uh, of any structure being nominated. And uh, with that, I reviewed this. Uh, it is uh, staff's opinion that this does not appear eligible for the national register. Um, it doesn't meet all the criteria, uh, one of which it, uh, the, usually it's, properties are associated uh, with living persons are usually not eligible for the uh, national register. And also, if, if it's just for reasons of, um, uh, it has to be associated with the person's productive life, and we just didn't feel that was strong enough. So again, staff's opinion is this is not eligible for the National Register. Uh, as of today's date, the City Council has de designated 55 structures in the city as historic resources. If you designate this one, that would become the 56th. Uh, I've attached several things to the staff report, the resolution, the consent letter from Ms. Ballard, to the designation, some photos, aerial photography, um, and the letter objecting to the nomination. For this public hearing today, <clears throat> the city did not receive any 
letters or comments or phone calls regarding the designation. Uh, also, the entire Historic Preservation Commission is here sitting in the front row, and I believe that our chairwoman, Carol Leibowitz, would like to say a few words if the council wishes to hear. With that, uh, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, please, Carol, go right up. Go right up and uh, make your report or state your observations. Thank you. Mayor Hobart and Councilman and Kay Ballard and audience. Speaking of the microphone. My name is Carol please. Leibowitz, and I am the chairperson of the Historic Preservation Commission of Rancho Mirage. I'd like to introduce my fellow commissioners here, Bob Berg, Ray Keller, and Robert Safran. Thank you. Um, we are proud to present to the council our recommendation for the designation as an historic resource, the home at 71475 K. Ballard Lane, which belongs to Miss Ballard, who is seated on the left side of the um, room in the last row. Desi Arnaz and his second wife, Edith Hirsch, bought the house in 1964. Miss Ballard bought this home fully furnished from Desi Arnaz in 1970. Desi was Kay's producer in the TV series, The Mothers-in-Law. Some of the entertainers who stayed in the house, and I'm only gonna mention a few because Kay, Kay gave me a list of more, um, were- Speak into the microphone, please. Were Carol. Johnny Carson, uh, Doris Day, Shelley Winters, Jack Cassidy, and Shirley Jones, B. Arthur, um, Jack Parr, Paul Lynn, Gavin McLeod, Lucille, I Love Lucy Ball, and Jimmy Durante. One other little snippet. Um, many people are curious about the lives of celebrities, especially those who live in our community. At almost 90 years of age, we would hate to think that Kay lives alone. She does not. She lives uh, her, with her faithful companion, Mavon Wade Jen, who is, a, who is an, a celebrity in her own right. Born in Wales, Miss Jen was a celebrity uh, with many credits as an actress and singer on the stages of London and Broadway, and in the movies such as The Bedroom Window, The Elephant Man, and The Bunny Caper. While the house does not qualify as an historic s site for its architecture, you can see from this impressive list that the house qualifies for designation <clears throat> pursuant to Rancho Mirage Municipal Code 15.27 as an historic resource because of its celebrity status. Um, the subject structure signi signifies an historical event or is associating with persons or events that have made a meaningful contribution to the city, state, or nation. To our city, Kay and Ballard indeed has made a contribution. And you will see, our commission is not the only one to recognize Kay Ballard for her celebrity status and many contributions to Rancho Mirage. Uh, in 2003, the city of Rancho Mirage changed the name of Mashi Drive to K. Ballard Drive, and that is where K. this Ballard house is Lane. located. K. Ballard Lane, excuse me, K. Ballard Lane. In 2004, the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce awarded Kay its Distinguished Citizen. We are attempting to continue that tradition by recommending that you, the council, designate Kay Ballard's home as a historic resource. By so doing, the city will be keeping Kay's house preserved as a site of reminder of the famous people and events that took place there. In closing, I would like to encourage our listeners who believe that they may have a home in Rancho Mirage <clears throat> that once belonged to a celebrity or is a, a celebrity who has a home here and who has made a meaningful contribution to our city, provide some kind of verifiable proof and research first, and then contact Britt Wilson, our staff liaison, at 760-324-4511, and he can tell you what you need to do, and he would bring the matter to our attention. We very much appreciate your designation of this house as a celebrity historic site. 
Does any member Thank up you. here have a question of Ms. Leibowitz? Thank you, Carol, very much. Thank you. Um, is uh, Kay, um, Kay, are you able to uh, walk down that steep hill there? <laughs> That's right. She said you. She said you weren't 90 yet. So what the heck? <laughs> Well, don't slow down. Just keep heading to the microphone, <laughs> and, every, and everybody can and everybody can hear your <coughs> comments. Pull the no, microphone really, down. No, really, truly, I'm Please. so proud of it. And she forgot to mention a few people, like Yosef Karsh, who stayed at the house for two two weeks. I've had wonderful people there. I've had that house. I've been in that house bodily since 1968, but I bought it in 1970. And the lady that says that Desi Arnaz lived in the corner is swimming in a pool of derangement. <laughs> because <laughs> I knew the man that, it was Mr. Neary and Mary Neary that had that corner house. And I don't know what her problem is. She said it was vanity, I think. It isn't vanity. I'm very sentimental about the house and sentimental about the people that stayed there like Shelley Winters and Doris Day and many, many, Ross Hunter, many, many wonderful people when there weren't any houses around there <laughs> except Keniston. And I'm just so proud of it. Rancho Mirage is sentimental toward you. <clears throat> I love Rancho Mirage. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know about this. When I talked about it on the air, they said, you live in Palm Springs? I said, no, I live in Rancho Mirage. I love it. Dick knows I've always loved it. <laughs> Does anybody have a question of Miss Ballard? No, but you, I will say this, um, Kay, you don't seem nervous at all in front of a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> no, you know, really, and I heard that it was a famous architect because there's a huge steel beam in the middle of it, and it was built as a party house. And it certainly was. <laughs> and Desi Arnaz certainly made it a party house because he did a lot of cooking there and gambling and everything else. <laughs> Kay, hey, is it still a party house? Yes, yes. it is, Richard. <laughs> hey, it certainly is. You. As a matter of fact, Carol Channing is coming to the house tomorrow night. Hi, Charles. Hi, sweetie. Mm -hmm. I saw you on, the, um, on YouTube on The View when you were on the, when your book came out. And you did talk about, it isn't Palm Springs, it is Rancho Mirage. That's right. And I really thought that was good. I'm very, very proud of Rancho Mirage. You're in the middle of everything. Yes, you are, you are. When people brag about Indian Wells, you're just five minutes from there. <laughs> Palm Springs, from everywhere. I love it. Well, and the people that here. stayed there loved it. And I talked people into moving here because of it. Gavin McLeod and uh, many, many other people. As a matter of fact, Ginger Rogers came to me and said, oh, she wanted to buy my house in, in uh, L.A. And I said, why are you thinking of L.A.? You want to go swimming every day, then go to Rancho Mirage. <laughs> and she did. And so did Carol Channing, didn't she? Carol Channing deserves everything, everything. She's one of the great people in show business. She's entertained more people than anybody in the world. Really, it breaks my heart because how dare the president give a medal to B.B. King and to Elaine Stritch and not mention Carol Channing. Oh, now I'm fighting for something else. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any additional questions of not at Kay? All. Okay, uh, well, we still have to vote on it. Uh, you've done a good job of lobbying us. Uh, <laughs> so uh, okay. if, uh, we thank you, and we're glad that uh, you've got uh, at least 15, I'll tell you years ahead of you, or if not more. Mayor, I want to tell you something else. I'm, I'm really pleased with Carol and her husband because I didn't beg for this. But when she mentioned it, I thought, oh, what a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's the truth. Thank you, Mayor. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
<laughs> Is there anybody else in the public uh, audience that would like to address this subject? If not, then I would like to make a uh, motion that the Historical Preservation Commission recommends that the City Council adopt resolution number 2015, approving the designation of 71475 K. Ballard Lane as a historical resource pursuant to Rancho Mirage Municipal Code, Chapter 15.27. It's moved in, seconded. Any further discussion? Please vote. Motion, surprisingly, carries unanimously. <laughs> Hi, Mavonwi. Okay, well, we'll go back to where uh, we were. And, um, <clears throat> We will insert an agenda item that got noticed late, um, having to do with uh, update on the CV link. We'll insert that now so that people who wanted to comment on it under public comment can easily transition to one side or the other. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I just uh, wanted to um, bring everybody up to date where we are with respect to the uh, CV link issues that. Uh, we've been talking about for a month and a half or two months now. The city of Rancho Mirage has got four motions that it has uh, asked to be placed on the June 1 agenda for the executive committee of the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, CVAG. <clears throat> These all have to do with the issue of the CV link one way or another. One motion is to convene an all-day CV link discussion with all of the cities uh, in the valley that are affected. Uh, the idea is to have members of the council, finance directors, city managers of each city all, in, all appearing at the same time in a venue that's suitable for such a large uh, uh, discussion and uh, so that we all hear the same answers at the same time and we hear what the concerns of each other are. And the subjects that we've asked to be uh, included but not limited to the following, uh, that assuming a projection of $1.6 million uh, for the first full year of operation of the link uh, as operations and maintenance, use that as the basis because that is the figure that appears in the master plan, uh, one, 1. 1.6 million per year in operations and maintenance expenses, also referred to as O and M expenses. Among the questions are how many years of life are projected for the CV Link's need for operations and, and uh, maintenance? What are the top three or four funding formulas currently being considered uh, respecting the payment of that money uh, and who pays how much. Uh, it's requested that there be a thorough discussion of the proposed 8% transient occupancy tax uh, proposal that has been advanced where a percentage of our increase in bed tax, transient occupancy tax, uh, goes to the fund uh, for the upkeep of the uh, CV link, to have that thoroughly discussed, and uh, to have a, a discussion as to the options uh, if the projected expenses that uh, we might initially agree to, what happens if there are problems? Uh, will cities be obliged to sign contracts to indefinitely meet the cost? of other signatory cities that fail in the uh, ability to keep up the payments for decades to come? Uh, how will that be handled? Uh, if there are defaults, uh, how will they be handled? What other cities, what cities or other mechanism uh, will there be to um, keep the fund solvent? 
Will it impact the cities who are paying? Will they have to pay more? Uh, what happens if a city files for bankruptcy relief and is eliminated entirely from a commitment to um, uh, participate in the O&M funding over the years? Well, those kinds of issues are what we're hoping will be discussed in an all-day meeting. The second motion is for the executive committee to approve a request to form a committee of the whole of the executive board of uh, CVAG for a half-day meeting where we sit with the um, city staff, the CVAG staff, uh, and have them relate to us uh, all of the concepts of funding for the ongoing operations and maintenance expenses that uh, are anticipated. Let me say that the numbers are somewhat staggering. Uh, and the more staggering they are, more obviously the need is to have a funding source before we spend $100 million in constructing the CV link. <clears throat> the first year is projected by them officially at 1.6 million to be the cost. If you increase those costs annually at 2%, it's a pretty low number and I think reasonable, but if you project it at 2% increase each year over the preceding year, in year 63, a long time from our perspective, it won't be our burden, but there will be a Rancho Mirage there, and it will be their burden, perhaps. But in the year 63, we will have spent a little over $200 million in operations and maintenance expenses. So the question of who's going to make those payments is extremely important. And the issue that has to be confronted is do we and the other cities want the funds, that 200 million over 63 years, do we, is that our choice of how we would spend that money? Or are there better ways? People have to decide that. Each city has to decide it. And if we sit and meet together and talk about it, I think we'll all get a perspective uh, on that. The other issues that should be discussed at the half-day session include, do we, I'll save the, I was going to talk about major aid funds there for a second. I'll save that for another, another moment. Um, what other, what other methods of payment has CVAG considered? And did they reject it as some other methods of payment? Or are they still considering it? And if so, let us all know what those other methods of payment are. I do know that at one point they had contacted uh, our CVB uh, looking for funds from the Business Improvement District Fund. Uh, that wasn't possible. Uh, so what have they considered and where are they going? Uh, what are they considering to be the source of payment of the O&M funds that, if this is built, we're going to have to participate in if our city signs on to the program? The other motion, the third motion, is a, a request to obtain a legal opinion related to the use of Measure A funds. Measure A funds are a group of monies coming because of a vote taken by the voters in, Rancho Mar in uh, Riverside County in 2002. Up to 2002 had been in place for some years. There had been a one-half penny increase in our sales tax. In 2002, that was continued 
It had, a, it had a sunset clause in it and would have ended in 2002. In 2002, the uh, extension of that one-half one penny sales tax uh, was approved by just under 70% of the voters, and those funds have been designated by various uh, sources as to how they can be used. Uh, for example, let me just state that the voters at the time, when Measure A was passed in uh, 2002, where it was extended, I should say, in 2002, it, the, the ballot measure was designated as follows. To relieve traffic congestion, improve safety and air quality, widen and improve certain designated routes, uh, highways 10, 15, 60, 71, and so forth, a bunch of them, maintain community streets, expand transi uh, transit for seniors and persons with disabilities, expand Metrolink commuter rail, and to conduct independent financial audits and authorize bonds up to $500 million. Clearly, it was intended to be a source of money to repair the deteriorated condition of Riverside County roads. Measure A funds were spread out in two directions, western and eastern county, western halves and eastern half of Riverside County. Uh, they're referred to as regional Measure A funds. Coachella Valley, I think, gets something like 35 percent or 50 percent, I'm quite, not quite positive, of the uh, regional funds in Measure A in eastern Riverside County. All of the money coming in from Measure A is under the guidance and auspices of the Riverside County Transportation Commission, RCTC. There is an ordinance prepared by the RCTC that was prepared some years ago, and it said, I'll only quote a sentence or two of it, of how Measure A funds could be used. Keep in mind, the issue is, is it legal for Measure A funds to be used to fund the operations and maintenance costs of the CV link? If it is built, can we properly use Measure A funds to help pay for that expense? Section 5 of Ordinance 2001 states purposes. Measure A funds may only be used for transportation purposes, including the administration of Division 25, including legal actions related thereto, the construction, capital, acquisition, maintenance and operations of streets, roads, highways, including state highways, and public transient transit systems and for related purposes. Synthesizing that sentence, it says they may only be used, as far as roads are concerned, may only be used for the maintenance and operation of streets, roads, and highways. So for the CV link to qualify for usage, the executive committee of CVAG would have to vote that it is an art that this path, whatever you call it, is an arterial roadway. It would have to be designated that in order to qualify under the language of the ordinance that I've just alluded to. The money then, if, if you designated that, the money would not be forthwith coming to the CV link. It would require also that the CV link as a project be added to the TIPS program. TIPS is a, an acronym called the Transportation Project Prioritization Study. 
This is a study of roads and highways and intersections in the Coachella Valley that are in need of serious repair. Dangerous intersections, perhaps, roadway a deterioration, perhaps. And there's a list of 247 projects that have already been placed on the TIPS list. Rancho Mirage has, I think, seven or so in this, uh, on this list. Coachella, Cathedral City have 30-some each. Indio, probably 30-some. 247 projects. For me, that's what Measure A is intended for. That's what we, ha we prior prioritize the deteriorated roads, starting at 1 down to 247, so that money can come in as money comes in from the sales tax increase, fills the coffers of the Measure A fund, and money is taken out of that coffer to pay for road improvements that are very much needed in the Coachella Valley. For the CV Link, a brand new project, if it got finished, for it to qualify for funding from, for maintenance, it would have to be designated as one of the high-ranking streets or roadways, highways, including state highways. It would have to be designated in such a category as to pump it way up that list so that it could qualify. So what we have asked for uh, in a motion that we have coming before the executive committee on, on uh, June 1st, what we've asked for is that CVAG authorize a legal opinion be obtained the language I've used is, you know, from a major law firm, either in Los Angeles, Orange County, or San Diego, where nobody, myself included, knows anybody, has any pull, has no in, inside contact, so that when we get a legal opinion, it will be accepted by all. So we're hoping that that motion is passed. And then the last motion that we have is to ask them to slow down the progress of the design and development that's going on presently. Uh, the link, CV Link has already cost us, it's hard to know exactly, but somewhere between two and four or five million dollars in design. Uh, they're still hiring people to work on the project. Television commercials are on TV frequently, and we're saying until we can see if the CV link can be funded for the operations and maintenance for the long-term life of the project, if, it can, if we can find an acceptable, mutually satisfactory way of funding it, then we will then all have to consider whether we want to go forward with the CV link or not. But at least we'll know it's fundable. If it's not going to be funded, then the money we're putting into it now will be money that will not be recovered. Uh, the money we're putting into it now is largely coming from grants from outside agencies. So it's not costing our cities anything, but we are spending grants. We have raised about $55 million. That is, the CV Link has raised about $55 million. They claim $75 million, but $20 million of it is CV Link money. And uh, I'm strike that. 20, 20 million of it is uh, Measure A funds that they're assuming they will get. And that assumption only comes to pass if it is designated as a r regional arterial and if it is placed high enough on the TIPS list of needy projects, then it could qualify. But they, so they've raised actually about 55,000 at the moment. 55 million, I'm sorry. So we're asking them to slow down the project 
I had sent a letter, an email to uh, Mr. Uh, Kirk, the executive director of CVAG, asking him to slow down until we determined if we're going to get the funding, long-term funding issue resolved or not. They've been on the project three years, and so far there's no program that's been acceptable. And he told me that, uh, by email, that uh, he didn't have the authority to slow it down. That had to be a direction coming from the executive committee. So that's why that motion, asking them to voluntarily slow things down until we can find out if there is a suitable plan that everybody can buy into for the long-term payment of the operations and maintenance expenses. So that's where we are now. We'll try to keep you posted of uh, developments. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ted Weil is on the Transportation Committee of CVAG. Uh, Iris Matrich is on uh, the Safety uh, Committee. Uh, Charles is on uh, the, what is it, Charles? The uh, Energy. <laughs> the Energy and Other Resources Committee. And I don't know, Richard, you're probably on something on there. No. Just hanging okay, out. Okay, and, and I'm on, the only one I'm on is the Executive Committee. So we'll keep you posted. That's the issue. The, 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 the issue, the most succinctly phrased is, are the cities going to be willing and able to come up with a funding method that takes money out of each city's coffers to meet the ongoing operations and maintenance expenses, which start at, an, at the annual amount of $1.6 million? So that's the question. and. Uh, we will now move to uh, public comments. And anybody who would like to speak on that subject can speak on that subject now uh, or um, not speak on it uh, now. It's called freedom of the press. <laughs> okay, uh, I do have one. Have you, signed, have you filled out one of these? Yes, sir. Are you Joyce Virtue? No. No, sir. Do we, have, do we have one over there for him? So I'll call you in just a second. But well, we've got it. We we want to stick by the process of he who puts in the yellow slip is first to uncurl the lip. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Okay, jo <laughs> Joyce Virtue. Is that him? Good afternoon, Mayor uh, Mayor Hobart and council members. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you spoke about the CV link because I have been thinking about that and I wrote a letter to the editor of the Desert Sun uh, to address some questions and of course you can't guarantee that they're going to answer these questions. So I'm going to read my letter, it's short, that I have written to the Desert Sun and I will start with it, and it says, with reference to your article in the Desert Sun on Sunday, May the 17th, 2015, and again on May the 19th, 2015, there are some questions that beg to be answered by the Desert Sun and CVAG. One, was a marketing study performed to determine with some certainty that use justifies the cost supporting the CV link. Did engineering costs of 100 million include elevations above white water, high water marks from past floodings? Could the CV link be washed out by another flood with replacement cost of plus 100 million dollars? Who were the consulting firms that were paid a million six? And what information did it produce? Transparency is key here. As a 25 year resident of Rancher Mirage, I strongly support and agree with you, Mayor Hobart, in that prudence and further investigation is of utmost importance in an effort of this magnitude and I signed it. I hope we can get these answers. I'm going to give it to Sydney for the record. Thank you, Ms. Virtue. Um, Mr. Worthy. Well, Alan Worthy.
Dorothy, thank you for having me. I guess Kay has stepped out. I'll come back to that, her, when uh, she comes back in, I think, I hope. There's Mavonway still here. Um, yeah, so I was uh, at the Palm Springs City Council meeting last night for the first time in just over two years because on the evening of March the 20th, 2013, uh, that was the evening that I was harassed by that cop that I've alluded to or talked about before, a federal offense. And uh, anyway, uh, I'm here to tell you, you know, without attacking the city, that, you know, we need, all need to move on. I'm not going to comment about the situation with Mayor Prunier because, as all of you know, up there I've been come and gone so often I'm really not up to speed on it. Uh, however, um, I, I can tell you the tenor was quite different amongst them. And I discussed, you know, what that cop did that, to me that night. I did attack them in the legal sense of, you know, how dare the five of them sit there and allow that to go on more than once. And what was it about? Just a gentle reminder about the crimes that started here in Rancho Mirage and has traveled back and forth across the desert for nearly three years. And he was preventing me from discussing it. So. Anyway, I put a demand on the city, and that's pertinent because they could have cured the lien on my condo. I wouldn't have gone to nearly the hell that I've gone through. And uh, they owe me the restitution, and uh, I think that it'll be a waymark. I asked them to uh, answer the demand and not ignore it, as they have in the past. And I say that for everyone's sake, so that, you know, the tenor all the way around continues to change there. Um, this, uh, there was a man standing at the front doors of the city hall. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I mean, you probably don't need me to tell you what a homeless encampment looks like. This is behind Staples and Walmart, uh, those vacant lots back there, of course, and my locked up condos a mere three blocks or two blocks from there. You know, um, and with regard to the CV link, it sounds like a big fat no. Uh, you know, the money and the upkeep, and uh, if you read the letter to the editor, was this man that put this packet together, uh, included one of them that ends with, the result, the use of the parkway by joggers and walkers has declined, and it now requires full-time police patrols seven days a week. So, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, Kay is back, so I waited for you to get back to the end. So congratulations, Kay and Mavonway. I can attest that they live in that house because I've had dinner there with them. And uh, that big round dining room table with a big round lazy Susan in the middle, I can remember saying, Kay, I'm glad I'm not drinking. It would spin around and spin around <laughs> like a roulette wheel. So we weren't drinking much, but there was plenty of gambling to see who was gonna catch the dip. So thank you for thank your you. time and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else uh, who would like to speak on anything they wish to speak on? State your name, if you would, please, and your city of residence. Ron Sharrow, Rancho Mirage. As you know, I did send a letter which was published in the Desert Sun. Uh, in response to one of the articles that they published. But I, there's an issue that's never been addressed publicly by anybody. Is there any benefit that anybody can even think of that the city would get from having that link run through here? It, it, will it produce any revenue? Will it add to our tax base in any way? Will it encourage people to shop here, to eat here, to, to spend their money in Rancho Mirage? Will it encourage additional uh, people to come in as tourists. Uh, I, I, I can't find any benefit to the city, nothing that would replenish the loss of the revenue necessary to, to pay for the O&M. And, and no one's addressed that. I, I just think it's an issue that should be considered. And, and I'd, like to, I'd like to find out if there is any potential benefit to the city from having the, the CV link. Thanks. Uh, to answer your question, go ahead. Uh, can I, I just want to give you a clue, the same clue for anybody else who would like to look at it. All you have to do is Google uh, Master Plan CV link, and you'll get their uh, Master Plan uh, dated uh, m uh, March of this year, and you can read, and you'll see what uh, they designate as being the benefits. Uh, so it's, it's accessible to you. Anybody else like to speak on something not on today's calendar? Okay, we'll move on then. And uh, 
Go to uh, board member comments. Who would like to utter some wise and sagacious words? Richard, you have your mouth open. Dana, I'll, I'll leave the uttering to you and I'll pass on the comments. Thank you, you've done an excellent oh. job. Okay, anybody down at this end? I'm good, thank you. You're good? My goodness gracious, it's such a quiet group of politicians. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, that's no. good. I'll make a okay, comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, you beg them, and then they pretend <laughs> like they had to be begged. You looked at me and turned away too quickly, actually. <clears throat> uh, tomorrow is a, uh, is a big event in Rancho Mirage. <clears throat> at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, we have the groundbreaking ceremony for the Rancho Los Palmas Shopping Center. Uh, this is going to be a very, very exciting day. Uh, the corner of Bob Hope and 111 is the second heaviest traveled corner in the valley. The developer will be introducing the major tenants that will be there, Steinmart, Hobby Lobby, possibly other tenants that they have signed leases with. Uh, the city will be represented and it's the start of construction of the first of five new buildings that will be going up. The transformation of this property in the last 13 months has been dramatic. This is a shopping center that stood 47% vacant 13 months ago, and at the present time is 84% pre-leased. So it's very exciting, it's of significant importance to the city, not only from a visual standpoint, but from a revenue standpoint. So tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock will be the groundbreaking. Everyone is invited, it's open to anyone that's available or convenient in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Cyrus. Thank you. Um, I have a few uh, comments that I wanted to make everyone aware of, and Josh, I think, is going to be putting up a photo uh, on our big screens. And um, I have want to talk to you about some good news and some news that can be improved. Um, according to the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, for the time period of July through October of 2014, since the launch of a program called PGA DUI, there was a 28% decrease in DUI arrests from the previous year in the cities of Palm Desert, Rancho Mirage, and Indian Wells combined. The information that needs to be a little bit improved on is that the fact that even with this good news of a reduction of 28%, there was still a total of 96 DUI arrests in those three cities. The good news is that there is an organization, which I just mentioned, PGA DUI, and I have a brochure from them, and it's called Parents and Guardians Against Drunk Driving. Um, I have the pleasure and honor to serve on a very important committee in the Coachella Valley Association of Governments Public Safety Committee, and that is the DUI Ad Hoc Committee. And this group has been uh, very anxious to implement a free ride home for those who have been drinking. The PGA DUI Foundation Free Ride Service is the first program of its kind in the United States. The foundation is a nonprofit organization which launched, it, launched its services with four vehicles in 2013. They are initially picking up riders in Palm Desert, Rancho Mirage, and Indian Wells to drop them off to their homes across the Coachella Valley. Although location pickup is restricted to these three cities at this time, they are planning to expand to cover the entire Coachella Valley in the very near future. This organization, Parents and Guardians Against Drunk Driving and Driving Under the Influence, believe that prevention is better than punishment. 
and unlike other DUI organizations, which seek to punish only after a DUI incident occurs, PGA DUI believes in helping to prevent and any and all DUI-related accidents, injuries, and, address, and arrests. Um, I was very fortunate that I could attend with my husband a special event that a group of students put together promoting this program, and they were at, this was put on at the Indio Fairgrounds a few weeks ago. And it was a very interesting program, and they planned to have a lot of kids attend. They had, I believe, over 200, and they're going to do it again at, next year. And it really acquaints the children and with what happens when you're under the influence. And they had the special goggles that they could wear to see how it would be to pass a sobriety test in the field. It was fascinating, and it really got the attention a lot of a lot of these students. We were very fortunate that they could put it on, and we were fortunate that I, I, my husband and I could attend, uh, because the communities have long struggled with the negative impact of impaired driving, uh, from needless deaths and injuries to overloaded criminal justice systems, alcohol-related and DUI arrests, and they all take an emotional and economic toll on society. So, we hope that you will look into this. It's a wonderful program. You can find it on your internet. You can also call them at 760-340-1500. Friday and Saturday, they are available from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. Their number again is 760-340-1500. And as we all know, um, we encourage people that if you are going to drink, please don't even consider getting behind a wheel. Now that you know that these services are available, uh, not getting behind the wheel certainly saves lives, and the lives you save certainly can be your own or that of your family if they happen to be in your car or those of others that uh, might be involved in an accident with you. So please listen to this and call these people. They're more than anxious to help you get home. Thank you so much. And the next thing I'd like to mention is that Bruce Harry, our, um, our director of our public works, is going to say a few words about our bridge that is going to be built. Yes, thank you, Councilman Slodrich. I just uh, wanted to let everybody know um, I'm happy to report that after two years of environmental studies on our proposed Frank Sinatra Bridge over the Whitewater, in an effort to acquire federal environmental clearances, we received that clearance yesterday from the federal uh, FHWA, and we are now um, able to proceed into design of the bridge and construction bid documents. So we have about a year's worth of uh, effort to put the design plans together, and we hope to have the project um, approved and out to bid uh, within 12 months, and then the project will take about 18 to 24 months to build. So we're looking at a construction start of like late 2016, early 2017. <coughs> and once we have the project built, we'll have an all-weather crossing over the channel, four lanes, what you see out there today, we'll have four lanes, plus we'll have uh, pedestrian facilities, bicycle facilities uh, to cross the bridge, which are lacking today with the low water crossing. So this is good news for us after two years of effort mm -hmm. that we're able to get that uh, environmental clearance from the federal government. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to uh, the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion for that for the meeting of May 7? So moved. Second. Please vote. The motion carries unanimously. We'd like now to uh, do the consent calendar. Which items are being pulled? Number five is being pulled. Yes. Anything and else? Yes, three, please. Three is being pulled. Okay, with respect to the remaining ones, uh, Randy, what are we talking about? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Number one is to waive full reading of the ordinances that are on your consent calendar. Uh, number two is second reading of an ordinance that would amend the standards for six-foot-tall walls and the front setback in custom home uh, gated communities. Number four, it would authorize me to execute a quick claim deed to Eric's furniture on the land that the um, 
Audi dealership is on. And number six, our number six is a re, uh, consideration of a resolution approving the CVB amended and restated joint powers agreement. Uh, there are some updates that the attorney has worked on. The last time they were updated was 2002. Uh, there is the uh, agreement is attached to your staff report, and I'm here to answer any questions. And number seven are demands. And before we vote, let me just make a comment with respect to item number six. Uh, that has to do with consideration of an amended and restated joint powers agreement with the CVB. Uh, I also participated in that at, uh, to some great length and uh, believe that uh, we have a good agreement uh, that uh, will help uh, things go smoothly for uh, Scott White and uh, the entire JPA. So um, I would recommend that as well. So. There's no further discussion on that from our side. Anybody in the audience wish to speak about any of the items that have not been pulled? Seeing none, can we have a motion then to approve all except items three and five? I'll make that motion. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Randy, where do we go for number three? Thank you. Number three is an agreement for design professional services with NARC Weather Architects. Charlie Martin's a local architect. Uh, we've hired him to work on the city's um, observatory project by the library. Now it's time for the contract to be signed, and there's two issues that we'd like uh, to waive uh, insurance requirements for. One is a $2 million requirement for commercial automobile liability insurance. He has a million dollars. Uh, of uh, insurance and the second one is the uh, council waive the um, commercial vehicle policy requirement as being in the uh, first position uh, in the event something happens. Uh, Glory and Steve, uh, our city attorney, have looked at these requested waivers and advised that the city would carry very little risk if they're approved and we're recommending approval. Thank you. With respect to number five. I have a question on three. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Uh, question on three. Uh, Randy, on page 3-1, the last sentence, which deals with the waiver of the requirement, can you explain that? Without waiver, the city would be assured that at least $2 million would be covered for any series of losses. Right, so he has a $1 million insurance policy. And because the, pro the uh, work that he's doing for us has to do with designing the observatory, there's very little driving back and forth that's needed, and he is local. So do we normally waive this provision? I think it's come up before, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we have waived it from time to time, and it uh, typically comes up for small firms. Larger firms have larger umbrella policies. Okay. Or if they're performing services that does, doesn't involve driving. Yeah. The other question had to do with the last sentence on, on page 3-2, which says the um, city likely does not have the luxury of delaying the commencement of services as the staff is working with a very strict <coughs> schedule prior to construction of the project. What schedule is that? I don't recall seeing the schedule. There is not a... Uh, um, written schedule is just that we have the funds that are the funds set aside for it. The subcommittee has been working for a long time and we've got our development team in place. We'd like to move forward with it. I think this is just overestimate, uh, overemphasizing that we want to move the project forward. Okay, so when it says that we don't have the luxury of doing this, we really do, but we, we'd like to get it done right now. Right. Okay, thank you. If we started over again on this particular part of it, we probably would delay the project by three months or more. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ms. Weil. Um, Mr. Mayor, my, uh, the reason for my pulling this item was the language on 3.2. <clears throat> and you've indicated that you feel that the exposure is de minimis. The, the language of NARC Weather's automobile insurance carrier may not necessarily cover damages or injuries resulting from an automobile accident, uh, alarm me, and was the reason that I wanted to get 
further assurance that the exposure uh, of the city was not inordinate. Thank you. I, I, I believe that the standard in automobile insurance with respect to the city's interest is adequate. It's just over the amounts because we're more concerned about them um, hurting somebody else and them suing us. So we're going to be assured that we at least have the million dollars coverage. So um, a lot of the other damages that are that result in the context of an accident generally aren't those kind of liabilities that are going to be passed on to us. We're just concerned about the bodily injury and any in, any um, personal injury, you know, that's, that results from the accident that can be passed on to us. That's what we're primarily concerned about. But the issue here is not really over the extent of the coverage, it's the amount of the coverage. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Steve. I move okay. approval of item number three. I'll second okay. that. Okay, we'll vote on it when we vote on the other one at the same time. Uh, item number five, Randy. Thank you. Item number five is that the council receive and file this report and give any additional direction as you may deem appropriate. Uh, we have had the uh, proliferation of online services that facilitate short-term rental of uh, private properties in the city of Rancho Mirage, a vacation rental ordinance that we have in effect. Uh, we have found it a little more difficult lately to track and reg register some of the vacation rentals in the city. A few of the cities, we understand, have entered into agreements with Airbnb, which is one of the larger companies, and they do collect the TOT on behalf of the cities, uh, these certain cities, for vacation rental transactions. Uh, it is, uh, Airbnb is different from some of the other services because they process the vacation rental transaction through their own website. It's easier for them to be able to comply with our short-term rental ordinance. So one advantage to the agreement would be that the city would not have to rely on or chase individual homeowners to collect uh, or pay the TOT. The uh, city attorney would report back with any proposal to the council subcommittee for consideration uh, if we are able to work an agreement with Airbnb. And I'd like to also point out that Robert Barrett, our director of marketing and public relations, has worked on this as well. Uh, in fact, he was instrumental in having all of the city attorneys and the Co city managers in the Coachella Valley sign a letter to Airbnb, and that really, I think, is the thing that brought them to the table and wanted to create an agreement so they can do all the cities at once instead of going city by city. Hmm. Well, Steve, do you have anything to <coughs> add to that? Yeah, this is not going to preclude other online companies from advertising short-term rentals, but I think that this is going to prove to uh, be a big advantage with respect to cities collecting TOT um, because they're they're basically like a dating service. They get the they match up the property owners with the guests, but the good thing about it is that they close that deal and they get that TOT and they pay it over to us. Some some people have heard that there were some issues between Airbnb and some other jurisdictions like San Francisco and, and in Santa Monica. The issue that's going on in Santa Monica is Santa Monica basically is banning short term rentals. So they're putting placing some really onerous conditions are on short-term rentals. And so Airbnb is involved with that, and there may be some litigation. What happened in the city of San Francisco is that the city of San Francisco had sued, or there was some litigation involving Airbnb, and they were claiming Airbnb had collected TOT in the past, and they were trying to get them to pay back TOT. But there was an issue as to whether or not they were actually collecting the TOT. But they worked out a deal where they are now collecting TOT for the city of San Francisco, and they're doing it for other jurisdictions as well. And those jurisdictions that have entered into contracts with Airbnb have seen a significant increase in their TOT revenue. What's the cost to you for this service? It's not going to cost us anything. It doesn't cost anything. Correct. How do they get paid? Well, they're they're getting paid by um, getting you know renting out the, um, the, the units. The homes. Yeah, it's not going to cost us anything. Well, they're taking part of the TOT then? As no, no, that TOT is going to 100% of it. Mm -hmm. They just charge a us. service fee for putting uh, the renter mm -hmm. and the homeowner together. Yeah, if they, if they present an agreement where they want to cut, I'm going to yeah. recommend that you not approve it. So whatever agreement that, that we end up with in the form of a draft, I am going to bring it back to the city council for its consideration. So it's a policing service, really? If you want to use that word. Yeah. Kind of a collection service. Yeah. And will we still retain the people that do this for us now? Yes. Well, yeah, anybody out there who's providing the service is free to 
to provide this service. Does anybody in the public like to discuss any of these two issues that we have remaining from the consent calendar? Okay, seeing nobody. On number three, we already have a motion and second. Please vote. I have one more question, Mr. Mayor, on number five before we vote. Sure. <clears throat> uh, do we know how many uh, properties have been uh, rented in Rancho Mirage by uh, Airbnb? Do you have any idea of the magnitude of it? I, I do not know. And on their statements, when they provide us uh, a statement as to the amount that they've collected, is there any sort of audited reports that we get? Uh, have the other cities done any, any auditing of any kind? I'm not sure, but in our, in our municipal code, we have the authority to conduct audits. I guess my question is, what do they provide us? Is it an audited statement or is it just a, uh, and I guess really that would fall into Isaiah's category as to what he would be satisfied when we, uh, when we receive re remuneration from them. Yeah, um, currently there is no agreement in place, so uh, we aren't receiving any TOT from Airbnb right. at this point. Uh, once an agreement would be made, it would simply be requiring them to turn in what every other homeowner that rents their home or hotel provides. There's a monthly TOT report that they provide to the city with payment. So, Robert, uh, Robert Barrett, uh, yeah. do you have anything to add to this uh, discussion and perhaps answer a question or two that's been raised by somebody? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Cindy uh, our contracted service provider in this area of vacation rentals, estimates that there are about 200 properties in Rancho Mirage that have contracted with Airbnb. But it must be understood that they also are on VRBO, vacation rental by owner. So it's not that they're in just one uh, promotional group. They're with multiple promotional groups in order to ensure that they get as much attention for their property as possible. So I don't know how many of the 200 are overlaps from other companies. In terms of, and by the way, the letter that was uh, signed by the city managers from across the city has brought Airbnb to the table. They uh, are concerned about collecting taxes in the past from their last five years of engaging in this sort of business. So that seems to be the one talking point that they're negotiating, and I'm glad that Steve is going to get involved to help with that negotiation. Um, I, I, I think that when we bring them into the fold, they will pay the taxes because they do collect the entire fee and the tax, and they will remit. But we will continue to have to do our surveillance work to ensure that the numbers that they're expressing to us are the numbers that we can see on their books, right? And then we also have the ability to audit them. But we will have to continue to, I think, survey their work and the presentation of houses in Rancho Mirage, which is somewhat difficult because they don't list addresses. But we know our properties so well um, over the last number of years, we, we really do know our vacation rental properties practically by sight. So if we see a picture of them, we can identify most of them. Great. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Robert, Any question or just, just one question. Going back to the question I raised before, how do they get paid? Do they get paid directly by the owner of the property? Yeah, um, no. The person that's renting the property Negoci negotiates agreement with uh, Airbnb, and they pay the full payment to Airbnb and have in the past paid a tax. And the reason that Airbnb is in a very difficult situation is because when you collect a tax and not remit a tax, it's a serious issue. So once they get a letter from San Francisco or another uh, municipality, they immediately begin to comply. But for about five years, they got away with it. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Close enough. Huh? Close enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you, though. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, a little can, mystery there. Can we have a motion to receive and file the report? So moved. I'll second that. Please vote.
Motion carries unanimously. We've done, we go to, we go to number nine. <coughs> Appointments to city commissions. Uh, uh, city Scott. Thank you, Mayor. As is our process each year, advertisements and notices inviting applications were posted at City Hall and the library, published in the Desert Sun, posted on the website, and sent out by eBlast. Applications are on file in the City Clerk's Office and have been forwarded to the City Council for consideration. All terms for currently seated commissioners are for one year and expire on June 1, 2015. Although there is a maximum service limit of four consecutive terms, the City Council has the option of voting to waive any term limits that would otherwise prohibit current commissioners from re being reappointed. Once a motion has been made to waive <coughs> any term limits, I will read the nominations for a single commission, and when all nominations for that commission have been offered, Mayor Hobart will call for a voice vote of the Council to confirm each commission's nominations. Do you have any questions before we start the um, I have commissions? A Because we have not received any indication that any of the nominees uh, would receive a no vote, uh, what Cindy uh, Scott will do is read all of the nominations to each of the commissions, uh, one at a time, ad seriatim, as somebody once said in the room, and um, then we'll vote one time to approve all of them. So please go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Okay, we'll start with Architectural Review Board. Mayor Hobart nominates Dennis Freeman, Kevin Groschow, and Dave Press. Bud Kopp, the Planning Manager, nominates Paul Sturwald, Tim Holt, William Carl Johnson, Charles Martin, and Ray Lopez. Moving on to the Community C Cultural Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Suzanne Matthews, Councilmember Kite nominates Joyce Virtue. Councilmember Smartrich nominates Sally Trademan. Councilmember Townsend nominates Julie Childers. And Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Frank Farino. For the Community Emergency Preparedness, uh, Mayor Hobart has three nominations and will defer his nominations to a future meeting. Councilmember Kite nominates Claudia Fawcett and James McFarland and Marsha Stein. Councilmember Smotrich nominates Albert Kelly, Virginia Luring, and Richard Heller. Councilmember Townsend will defer two of his appointments to the next meeting and nominates David Richardson for his remaining seat. Mayor Pro Tem Weil will nominate Stan Wilson, Lynn Coker, and Mary Lou Souter. For the Historic Preservation Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Carol Liebowitz. Councilmember Kite nominates Robert Zafran. Councilmember Smartrich nominates Daniel Schwartz. Councilmember Townsend nominates Richard Berg, Jr and Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Ray Keller. The Housing Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Thomas Weil. Council Member Kite will defer his nomination to the next meeting. Council Member Smartrich nominates Alvin Fink. Mayor Pro Tem Townsend nominates Paul Seibel. And, oops. Council member Not Townsend. Yet. There must be two. Not yet. There must be two people in that position. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I'm sorry. Council member Townsend no, but nominates Paul Seibel. Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Mark Bengston. And Mary Bundy and Velma Coombs were nominated for 
the um, project tenant. Library Advisory Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Stephen Lax. Council Member Kite nominates Deanne Nichols. Council Member Smartrich nominates Rissa Lumley. Council Member Townsend nominates M. Kirk Pickrell. And Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Dr. Carl Brown. The Mobile Home Fair Practices <coughs> Commission. Mayor Hobart nominates Daryl Mulvihill. Council Member Kite nominates Sam Spivak. Council Member Smartrich nominates Jason Agostini. Council Member Townsend nominates David Gray. And Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Jerry Lynn Freeby. And the non two non voting members are Jerry Bergquist and Kathy Buckmaster. And moving to community parks and recreation. Mayor Hobart nominates Paul Hagel. Council Member Kite nominates Deborah Grindel. Council Member Smartrich nominates Judith Cohn. Council Member Weil, nope, Council Member Townsend nominates Diane Rubin. And Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Deborah Sarlat. For the Planning Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Michael Adams. Council Member Kite nominates Ann Winchester. Council Member Smartrich nominates William Maxwell. Council Member Townsend nominates Larry Nichols. And Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates William Berdowski. For the speaker series, Mayor Hobart nominates Charles Barrett. Council Member Kite nominates Lynn Mulatto. Council Member Smartrich nominates Ron Shero. Council Member Townsend nominates Nick Procaccino. Council Member Weil will defer his nomination to the next meeting. And that's it for speaker series. Moving to Traffic Safety Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Robert Cromlin. Council Member Kite nominates John Sanborn. Council Member Smotrich nominates Steve Shuey. Council Member Townsend nominates Don Smith, and Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Robert J. Buskus. Two at-large nominations are James Miller and Cal Custer. Community Trails Commission, Mayor Hobart nominates Columba Quintero. Council Member Kite nominates Carol Hawksprung. Council Member Smartrich nominates Eric Wright. Council Member Townsend nominates Dennis Constant. And Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Jeffrey Morgan. Okay, the last one is the Library Foundation Board. Council Member Hobart nominates Sherry Stewart. And he defers one nomination to the next meeting. Council Member Kite nominates Linda Bray and Peter Samuels. Council Member Smartridge nominates Patrice Merritt and Diane Sagan. Council Member Townsend will defer one nomination to the next meeting and nominates Nancy Cunningham. Mayor Pro Tem Weil nominates Lucy Mepos and Charles Rich. And that's the end of it. Is there a motion? Oh, we have more, don't we? Or do we? No, that's it. I have a question. Back on the historic preservation, did you say Robert or Richard Bird? Hmm? I'm sorry. On historic did you say Robert or, you, or did you say Richard Bird? On, on, on yours, you Robert Bird? That was it. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Dana, I had a question. On the Emergency Preparedness Commission, did you intentionally omit the two technical advisors? No, the two technical advisors really, um, as I understand it, don't have to be renominated every year. Okay. How often do they have to be renominated? Well, Mr. Maletti, I understand, has a lifetime term, and Mr. Tang requested appointment, and I let Mayor Hobart do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have we uh, 
solidified uh, anything here? <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, uh, with respect to uh, the nominations, then, is there a motion to approve the nominated people to be the appointed people? So moved. I'll second. second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries unanimously. We'll move to item number 10. Randy, what's this one about? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Pleasure to present this today. You remember that you had requested that I schedule an item on a council agenda regarding the uh, historic statewide, statewide drought that we're all experiencing right now and what we can do as citizens and as the city to conserve water. So I'd like to make some introductory comments and I've also assembled a water task force of several of my finest staff members. Each of them are assigned to update the council on some aspect of our efforts. Uh, then I'd like to turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor, for discussion and direction, although I do have two specific recommendations to start with uh, listed in the middle of page 10-1 in your staff report. We'll get to that in a minute. January 17, 2014, Governor Brown declared a, a drought state of emergency. On April 25, 2014, the governor issued an executive order calling on the state to redouble the state government's efforts in response to the drought. The executive order directed that the State Water Resources Control Board adopt emergency regulations to ensure that the urban water suppliers such as the Coachella Valley Water District implement drought response plans to limit outdoor irrigation and other wasteful practices. We uh, all know that the CVWD is the water purveyor for the city of Rancho Mirage and much of the rest of the Coachella Valley. From August 2014 to March of 2015, Californians saved over 125 billion gallons of water However, this was only a statewide reduction of 9% when compared to the same months in the previous year. On April 1st of this year, 2015, Governor Brown signed a new executive order directing the State Water Board to impose restrictions to achieve a statewide 25% reduction in urban water usage through February 2016. Uh, because of the higher per capita water usage in certain water districts throughout the state, the mandate was to cut back 36% instead of 25%, and the Coachella Valley Water District is one of those districts. Uh, on May 11, 2015, a week ago Monday, my water task force participated in a workshop that was conducted by the CVWD officials for the purpose of convening local government staff to discuss and provide input on the regulatory framework for implementing the governor's mandate. Uh, the next day, the CVWD Board of direct Directors adopted the regulatory framework, and it's known as Ordinance Number 1419, and it's an exhibit in your packet. It's an entitled an ordinance of the Coachella Valley Water District imposing mandatory restrictions on water use in order to comply with the statewide drought regulations. Uh, this is, this runs till February 28, 2016. It's called the 270-day uh, drought ordinance. But I think we should all be prepared for the drought to continue. We can't count on uh, heavy snowpack or El Nino this coming um, winter, although we'd like <coughs> to see that. So, Mr. Mayor, first and for foremost, everybody wants to know, am I using too much water how will this affect my water bill? Do I have to cut back 36% from what I was using previously? What are the benchmarks? How do we do what we need to do? So along those lines, Joseph Carpenter, our economic development an analyst, has a sample water bill that he's going to show you and explain to everybody how you look at your water bill, whether or not you're being efficient, and how you measure what, what the costs will be and your conservation measures for the future. Joseph? Thank you, Mr. Finder. Mr. Mayor? Uh, short uh, presentation. Joseph, grab onto the microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, short uh, PowerPoint, as well as our, some of our fellow staff members. Uh, my portion is the drought penalties and water conservation goals. 
On this first slide here, you'll see our existing tiers that CVWD does charge uh, Ranch Mirage customers. It's a base rate of $1.12 per unit, and then it varies on each tier that you go into. The drought penalty that will be applied to those tiers on that far right-hand column. So if you were to look at tier two as an example, the normal base rate was $1.12. If you go into the drought penalty, that total comes out to 363. As tier four as an example, the existing was 224. If you hit that tier and you add in the penalty, each unit of water would be 725. Uh, an, an important note is the 36% conservation is from your tier two water budget, not your overall water consumption. So to find your budget on your bill, it's kind of in the middle portion on the left-hand side. It's in that red box. I've brought that out in a little bigger detail. In that first line, your water budget for this period, in this particular case, is 19 units. <clears throat> And the water budget is a way that the CVWD calculates what your water usage ought to be. It's based on the lot size, square footage of your lot, the square footage of your home. It, it assumes uh, four people, I think, in a household. So everybody's water budget is a little bit different. Correct. Everyone's water budget is different. They do assign 10 units for indoor use, and then your Tier 2 budget, as Mr. Binder stated, is determined by lot size estimated coverage, and that does adjust. Uh, CVWD does have a, a formula that takes into weather, and it, it adjusts your budget monthly. So you would kind of need to look at historical usage to get an idea of what the budget was in prior months. So uh, to calculate your 36%, I kind of have the correct way and the wrong way. So if you're using your water budget, which in this case, that sample has 31 CCFs, you have the 31 CCFs, you take your 10 units out, it gives you a tier two budget of 21. That's where the 36% saving needs to come from. So your adjusted tier two would be 14, adding in your original 10. Your permitted use is gonna be 24 in this particular sample. The wrong way to do it would to be take your water use, which in this case was 25. If you less the 36, you get 16. You don't need to cut that low. Um, if you want to, feel free. It's going to help everyone with their conservation efforts. But you're permitted the 24. So I have two sample bills to show you. Next slide. On this one, their Tier 2 charge, they have six units at $1.10. It's the highlighted portion in the middle. Their particular water budget for this month was 29 units. They only used six. So their existing water charge was $6.06. <clears throat> Since they were well under usage, their new one's going to be that same 606. Next slide, on this sample here, they have a water budget of 31 units. They've used 25 units. Under the old method, they would have paid 26.90 for that water. But when you apply that 36% conservation, their tier two should have been 14 units. And in this case, they were at 15 units. So they have one unit overage and penalty. And that chart at the bottom kind of breaks it out. They have their standard rate for tier one and 14 units of tier two and they have one unit inside tier two that's going to get the penalty an extra six dollars and i'm sorry three dollars and 63 cents so the old method they would have paid 26.90 for those 25 units with those penalties in place it would be 29.41 under this new method that's a uh, kind of my portion for get an idea of your water budget where the 36% reduction should come from, which is the tier two budget, not the water consumption. And so I'm gonna pass it off to Joel. He's gonna tell you a little bit about what the city's done in the past and plans for the future on what the city's doing to attack this drought. I have a question. Absolutely. Yesterday at a uh, meeting at the Homeowners Association, the management company said that June bill will come out to show you what the effect will be for July. In other words, they'll give you an example of Correct. what you're using and what the next bill really will be. Correct. Your, your May usage, when you get that bill in June, right. is going to have a June bill and a shadow bill. And that shadow bill would be what would happen if those penalties were in place. Good. And then when you get your June usage, when you get that bill in July, everything will be on that actual yeah. bill. 
Good. So it'll show, you know, it'll what you've done you and what you have to do or not do. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Joseph. Joel? Joel Castillo is our senior building and parks maintenance worker. He's going to show us uh, what the city has done to conserve water while keeping our public lands beautiful. Mayor Horvath, uh, council members, um, I was tasked to, uh, to bring what the city is doing as a whole to meet these mandates. And the first three uh, slides that I have are uh, uh, something that we have already started. And, uh, and this uh, three projects, which is, if we, the first one was Morningside, this is Cypress, and this next one is Mirage Cove. Now we had quite a bit of, of uh, turf there that we removed and now we're, we went to uh, drought tolerant plants and as, as the past, that's where we're trying to get and alleviate some of this problem with, with the water and stuff like that. Now these next slides, um, this is Wolfson Park and as you all know, we had a fountain there and uh, we are trying to accommodate everything and try to meet these mandates. Um, that we had to drain the, the fountain and kind of aesthetically make it look, you know, presentable and safe so that nobody, you know, trips into it or anything like that. Uh, this next one is uh, Frank Sinatra and Duvall. And this corner lot is, was being watered all together and we have uh, seized the water on that and we're only watering the, the tree life palm trees, uh, citrus, and stuff like that. Everything else has been turned off. In that corner, we had uh, color there, which, you know, that I think also was something that was going to go away with this new mandates and stuff like that. So we went to desert tolerant plants and uh, less water. Uh, this next slide, slide, sorry, uh, is Bob Hope and Palm Haven, uh, the Mirage Estates. This also, we had a lot of turf. We, we had quite a bit of turf there that was taken out and now we've gone to uh, uh, drought tolerant plants and it's, 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 it just makes sense, you know, for the direction we're headed in. This next slide is, shows uh, what we're doing now as of uh, uh, right now. the governor's, the governor's drought mandate drought mandate is, uh, is, is we, we jumped on this right away. As soon as we heard, we, we started taking all the, the, the turf away so that we are more conscious of, of the water that we're putting out. Now, only the, the, the plants and tree life are the ones that are gonna, are, are, is what's going to have water. This is uh, Edison substation, also has turf. We're removing all the turf off from our parkways. This next one is Fire Station 50. This they have not gone to, but we will get to it soon. Um, last is uh, Cancer Park. Cancer Park will be, um, the, we'll be removing the turf all the way to the tree line. I don't know if you could uh, it's not a very good picture, but we will be m removing all that turf from that tree line because obviously we were using quite a bit of water there and we want to, you know, not use or consume so much water there. And basically that's m my presentation. Mm -hmm. Question, Any questions? Randy? On the park areas that we're taking the grass out, are we going to be putting in drought tolerant plants? Um, there has been discussions, and I think we have gone, uh, we have asked the, the contractor that did uh, um, Frank Sinatra and Duvall to give us kind of an estimate, a rough estimate, what it will cost to, to put some DG and maybe some plants. Now, we don't really want to go plant because it's quite a big of area, so I believe they would, would be more... Better in this in this case would be just DJ, you know, the desert gold mm -hmm. DJ, and and just leave it at that, and not have any water consumption. Could I add one thing, uh, Mayor Hobart? 
Could I add yeah. one comment? Please. I just, I just wanted to let everybody know, for the last 10 years, the city's been aggressively removing the turf out of our medians, and uh, we, we um, have been water conscious for much longer than um, since yeah. the uh, governor's mandate. Um, we do not have any turf remaining in any of our medians, which is a strict requirement of the mandate that you, do, that you cannot put water on your streets, on any hardscape, things like that. We're now taking this to a new level. We're getting rid of the turf in the parkways, um, and we are gonna look at putting some DG back in and maybe some sparse uh, load, um, uh, some drought tolerant type plants with drip irrigation. So um, the city's been uh, basically a, the, um, a leader in getting rid of turf out of our right of way. So this is, uh, this is uh, the last bit that we're having to do and I think we should be proud of what we've done so far. I have a question, where are we with the, with the budget for removal giving it to homeowners or to uh, country clubs or, you know, associations. Do we have it yet decided? Is that what we're working on the budget it's right in now? The budget, it, it's in the budget, uh, proposed budget so that you'll not be reviewing out yet. very shortly. Right, because people ask me, you know, when is it coming out and what are what we the, doing? Uh, what the committee recommended, Richard Kite and I recommended was that uh, we <clears throat> assign a, a maximum of $1,000 per person with fifty thousand uh, dollar cap total lid for all everybody. Good. That's what's coming to you in the budget right. recommendation. We actually doubled the amount that had been approved for last year. So right. there'll be a separate amount for individuals for HOAs, and then of course the CV Water District will have some funding available for the same residents. And how do they apply for this? Come to City Hall, or what's the What's the procedure? We're going to get to that. Okay, we're that's get to going. That. Very good. I'm ahead of it now. <laughs> that's a hard fit. Thank you. Okay, is there anything further on? Yes. Joel, you, you done? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. So next we're going to have uh, Sandra Johnson, Code Enforcement Officer, uh, Manager, tell us about how her department is helping our citizens save water. Sandra? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, I believe Jeremy had the turf conversion, so I'll just jump ahead of him if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Um, um, so as Bruce indicated, the city is, is well ahead of this task. Um, we started this actually last year when we had the manpower to kind of proactively go out and inform our residents about the impending uh, conservation goal that CVWD was going to be uh, having. So our goal was simply first to observe. So last year we, we solicited with CVWD and they gave us these flags and we've empowered all of our field staff to use these as markers to identify broken irrigation or excessive water runoff. So my code officer, Pamela Berkey, who's part of the water conservation team, has been going out proactively and identifying that, which is key because a lot of people don't know they're wasting water that way. So we were able to inform them, which is the set ne next step. And the way that we do that is we um, mark with the flag and then we go into the flyer. There's a door hanger here that CVWD has that uh, allows us to um, identify what those areas are where there's potential uh, excessive water. What you have before you here is an example of those areas that have been identified. On the left side, there's some broken irrigation. You can actually see one of the ones geysering up. Uh, on the left, on the right side is excessive water runoff on hardscape, which is sidewalks. And below that, uh, we have uh, one of our local businesses deciding to wash off the side of the building instead of using a broom which is what um, they're requesting for you to do. Next slide. And here is another picture of our little flag here that we identify those areas with. Here's the door hanger a little up close. What's unique about this, it, uh, CVWD has done a great job in, in informing you of what you can do. And then it gives you like a check box where we can, in the field, check those areas that we've observed that you potentially are having excess of water. We put this on the door with our business card so that we can somewhat be a liaison between CVWD and our residents to kind of cooperatively getting them in the mind frame of conserving water. Next slide. And there's the backside. Um, 
and when all else fails, uh, what we do is send out a notice. It's a courtesy letter, very soft, just saying, hey, by the way, we've tried to re you, reach you unsuccessfully, and this is our way of now trying to send something to you, maybe written communication, because maybe we have snowbirds, because we don't want these in conspicuous spaces also, because we don't want people to know the home is vacant. So we try to put them strategically in places maybe they can find, but not rings an alarm. So this letter then is sent via mail to say, we've attempted to get in touch with you, uh, there are some water issues, particularly at your home, that we'd like to address with you. Next slide. And um, Jeremy will go into this next, but this is a sample of a turf conversion where basically on the right side, on the left side you see the turf, right side is the conversion where it's DG and drought tolerant plants. Um, with that, uh, if you guys have any other questions. Oh, last slide, I'm sorry. This is a quick table um, to show you what we've done so far. Um, for the city of uh, Rancho Mirage, we've had over 60 um, calls or proactive um, cases that's been generated as a result of this program that started. From that, we've done about 120 follow-up inspections and then warnings that were issued. And throughout this whole process, what's good to note is only one person actually that we had to become aggressive with in identifying that you are now exceeding what's, a, what's the permitted uh, allotment for water and you're now draining in an area, particularly on our streets, where we need to inform you at a higher level. Yeah. And starting in July, it, not, it won't just be code enforcement that they'll be seeing a significant increase in their water bill if they aren't able to cut back. Yes. Sandra, on the um, door, on the notices that you actually put on the areas that are problem areas, we're only doing the areas outside gated communities. Is that true? Yes, but we are, if we're able to get access in a gated community, we do go the extra mile in doing that. Uh, some HOAs have reached out to us and have invited us inside the HOAs to help assist with that. Okay, that would be a good idea because most of the area in Rancho Mirage is gated. So, Correct. So to get the most benefit, we've really got to reach out to those people. I agree, and that's part of our outreach. We also attend HOA meetings and do a similar presentation where we try to present this information so that they can then educate their residents. Right. And the other part, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The other part of it is, is working on an educational campaign for the gardeners, a lot of gardeners in the city of Rancho Mirage, and if you see them working out there, code will stop by and make sure that they understand that the uh, smart controllers are supposed to be on, irrigation are supposed to be on from sunset to 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And uh, also reminding them to check the irrigation system before they leave each time they do the service to make sure there isn't anything broken and that it's working properly. Right, and CVWD also has literature in English, both Spanish, to also to communicate with gardeners and landscapers so that they're aware of the I believe we have a representative here from CVWD also, so afterwards, if you'd like to ask any questions, I believe Don is in the audience. Thank With you. that, I give you Jeremy. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm here today to talk about the city's turf conversion rebate program um, and the steps that are needed to uh, facilitate or initiate that uh, process. So in its most basic form, uh, Rancho Mirage residents are eligible for up to 1,000 square feet of turf removal in their front yards. The rebate amount is $1 per square foot. And really all that's needed to initiate that process is a site plan that accurately reflects what the, uh, what the yard is going to look like once the grass is removed and a letter of endorsement from a homeowners association if in fact that person lives in a gated community. So the way the program works is once the the site plan is approved by the city. Um, the applicant then takes that plan to the water district for processing. The water district will actually inform the applicant when they can begin the project and they will do all the necessary inspections. So once the project is completed to the satisfaction of the water district, that's when the rebates are issued. So the program is a first come, first serve basis. Um, so what that means is, unfortunately, we won't be able to give everybody a rebate that goes through this process. Um, when the funding is exhausted for the year, then there's no more money to give out. The program is virtually the same for commercial and HOA applicants. The difference is that they're eligible for up to 5,000 square feet of conversion. 
And uh, the only other thing that's different is for any project that lies adjacent to a public street, we do require the plans to be prepared by a licensed landscape architect. Um, those are the two differences. And um, the process is essentially the same for, for both. So that's the program in a nutshell. I'd like to briefly show you uh, a site plan, an example of what we would accept in the planning department to initiate this process for an individual homeowner. What we're looking for on a site plan is a plant legend. So at the bottom, you can see that the types of plants that the applicant wants to use are identified. And at the top, it shows where those plants are going to be located in the yard. So this gives us the plant type, the quantity that's being used, and it's very basic. This one was done on a computer, but could easily have been done by hand. And this is perfectly um, acceptable acceptable for, for our processing. And, and you can so, do it over the counter, right, Jeremy? And we do this over the counter. Uh, we stamp it the same day so that you can get in line at the water district. Um, and then so the results of this plan are here. So on the top left, you can see what the yard looked like before. Uh, we approve the plan. And then when the project is completed, that's what you get on the bottom right. So, including uh, a new stucco in the house. <laughs> Does that come with it, huh? <laughs> new stucco nice. in the house. That's what comes stucco. with it. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, it's an upgrade aesthetically. It complements the house. It complements the streetscape. So this is really what we're looking for. And uh, to conclude my presentation, I just wanted to offer two resources that are available to residents. The first one on the left is a book that's put out by the Coachella Valley Water District. It's called Lush and Efficient. And what it is, it's a huge collection of climate appropriate and drought tolerant plant species. So for those residents who wish to design their yard by themselves, but they may not know what types of plants are appropriate, this is a great resource. It's available on the, the Water District's website in PDF form. And then at the right, this group, Y Green, they offer financing for energy efficiency and water conservation projects. So for those residents who might not have the funding available to do a large scale conversion, or maybe they just don't want to put up that cash on the front end, this might be a mechanism by which they can afford the, their conservation goals. Jeremy, could you go back to your first page, please? Yeah. Um, my next door neighbor indicated to me a couple days ago that he had um, come to the city at my request. I told him to come here. He'd complained about the county. He told me that he'd gone to the, uh, to the CVWD. He told me he had gone to CVWD and that they had told him they were a number of months behind processing and nothing was getting done, nothing new. He wanted, to, he wanted to take out some lawn in the front yard and put in artificial turf. Um, I think that we have to be able to accommodate people who want to act swiftly. I don't think that we should complicate our plan by sending them to the county or to, to the CVWD. Uh, that's, that's a bureaucratic step we don't need. If people come into our city, our city council, our city hall, and they say, uh, I, this is my idea, this is my plan. We should either be able to do one of two things, have them show photographs of it, which we could keep, or we send somebody out to take a look. And if it looks like it's a legitimate thing, not, not an HOA now, we're just talking about individuals, so he's not going to have to have a licensed uh, landscape architect, <clears throat> that we look at it and we tell him that when you're done with this project, uh, as you've described it, we think it's fine. Doesn't have to be glorious, as long as it's adequate. And in the case of somebody just replacing it with turf, I mean artificial turf, doesn't take much. Sure. Uh, but we ought to be able to turn that process quickly so that the people get their money, because if they're not going to get their money, it may prevent them from doing anything, because they may be relying on that money for the affordability of their move. Sure. So I really think that we've got to put together a plan that uh, eliminates CVWD and gives us a shortcut. We, we can have a couple of people, one person would probably be more than enough, who when somebody comes in with a plan, within 24 hours or 48 hours, 
drives over, looks at the project, takes, might maybe ask for photographs in their description, whatever the rule requires for submitting a, for, a, a, a plan, not a formal mm -hmm. one by a licensed landscape architect, but it give you an idea. And if it looks good, using a little discretion on the part of the city, not being uptight about it, uh, we can move it forward and get things done quickly. And I think that's the kind of plan we have to have. And I'm wondering if we couldn't ask for consideration of such a plan and come back at the next meeting uh, outlining some streamlined process, because this isn't working. It's not fair. Sure. I th and I think that's something we can certainly consider. Um, historically, we've just relied on the water district, but I think it's an opportunity for us to, to move these things forward. Rather people quickly. can deal with the CVWD in, in on their trying own. to get an additional dollar sure. a square foot. Sure. But that's not us pu pushing them there. Right. Right. And, and we're not dependent on them saying okay because we'll never be on the same page. Right. With uh, what the requirements they're going to be faced with. Dayton, yeah. we don't want them to lose the potential though for getting funding from the water district. No, no, we're not discouraging it at all. But if they take photographs, I'm sure that. They, whatever the CDWD process is, uh, all you have to do is establish what you're doing. Uh, I don't know. My next door neighbor didn't do, wasn't allowed to do anything. They talked them out of it, saying we were. I think the figure was seven months behind in applications. Yeah, well, that's. Uh, I did have a gentleman come in last week who was approved in October of last year and who just finished the project, who was just told he could start. So there is there is quite a bit of a delay. But I think what you're asking, Mr. Mayor, is that the city's process and the city's incentive program be uh, implemented independently yeah. of the water districts. I think that's, that's correct. That's yeah, right. that's the kind of input we're look, looking for. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Yes. Uh, just one question. If somebody wants to come to us and get the uh, rebate from us, and then they also want to go to uh, CVWD. Can they go to both entities and get money from both? Yes. yes. So that's something they're not going to The way it's prohibited. set up now is for them to go to the water district first. Right. What we're talking right. about here is modifying it so they can do their, their approval here at this level. Then they could go to the water district. Or we, we'd really have to talk to the water district and tell them, that we're implementing this process and we don't want those individuals to lose the ability to get exactly. the money. Yeah, and I think you'll find That's out that they support that. The water district supports each city putting out their own efforts. Right. Great. Uh, is there anybody in the audience that would like to discuss this issue? We will have it back on the agenda at the next meeting, but if you have some thoughts now, it would be a good time to make them known. And we have a CVWD representative, Patrick O'Dowd. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, sir. Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Uh, I'm Patrick O'Dowd, number five Lincoln Place in Ranch Mirage, California. And I echo my friend Kay's sentiments about the leadership of this city. And um, it's a pl privilege to live here. Um, I just wanted to come up and introduce myself and say hi. We have uh, Don Ackley from the district here to, to answer any questions directly. Specific to the city moving forward, with the turf removal program. I'm not exactly sure how it would work operationally with the district, but I think it's an outstanding idea. We find that any incentive whatsoever, we're, we're, we're being told by the, the gardeners and landscapers that any incentive whatsoever is just the inducement that people need to, to get these programs going. Of course, no. it would be their benefit if they could take advantage of both, but anything that's available now would be a good thing. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Patrick, do you think that it would be possible uh, that the CVWD would consider establishing a clause somewhere in their overall plan that says if a city approves something and the city ends up paying the $1,000 uh, or whatever the amount is, if it's less than that, that uh, that would be adequate for the CVWD. Yeah, I I'm, mean, you could train us to do the right thing. I'm not exactly sure where that stands. Some of the issues that we're dealing with, we do have some so again, Don can speak on this more specifically, but we do have some, some, some leftover money from last year's program. We have an upcoming budget cycle for the release of new funds, but what we don't know is what the fiscal impact to the district is gonna be as a result of a 36% reduction in, in water use and how that'll affect our ability to implement these programs, how deep, how wide. Uh, it's, a, it's a program that we've used successfully in the past 
but I don't know exactly, you know, the funding mechanisms that are available. The state, as part of the, uh, the governor's uh, drought declaration, said that funds were going to be made available, but I think that those are more going to be particularly targeted to lower income uh, uh, customers. So well, Perhaps in the process of not automatically rubber stamping it if the city did, but having uh, giving the city a couple of criteria that are um, important to you in assessing somebody's application, and we could incorporate that in our criteria. I, I so think that that's I think that's an excellent idea. My 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 concern would be, you know, just as, just as the city has only limited funds, you know, how far out would the district be able to commit? To, to customers for, for that availability and how, how would they get in well, line, if you will. Those are, those, those yeah. are great ideas. It's just the, you know, the implementation of it. I'm not sure exactly how it would work, but the, the professionals at the district who handle it day in and day out could probably address that and maybe come up with a, a mutually acceptable solution. Yeah, well, we appreciate your being here. And, Thank you. And anything we can do to help. Uh, well, I think it's tremendous, you know, the just, just you know, sitting back and listening to what all the city is doing proactively. Uh, the, the press asked me a couple of months ago, you know, how we were, how CBWD was going to reduce water consumption by 36 percent. My response was simply, we're not. It's going to be the people in the valley who take ownership of this situation who are going to do it themselves. And all we need to do as leaders in this community is give them the tools to succeed. And I think that we're going to go a long way to achieving what we need to, to achieve. If there's a way we can help you while we help ourselves in our own city uh, you know we, we're glad to do it we're eager to do it and uh, hopefully move the program so it doesn't get bogged down that must be the most frustrating thing to you is that you're apparently from what my neighbor tells me and I always believe hearsay uh, but it's uh, you know it's not it doesn't make you happy to know that you're right not, not current on that and uh, if we can help get you current by adopting some of your po points and directions as a part of our making $1,000 uh, available, uh, we, we want to do it. We want to help you in any way we can. Well, we do have some, some materials, some, some collateral material that will be available. And it, it, it you know, it essentially uh, revisits what, what was included in your presentation about rates and opportunities to to make sure that you don't find yourself penalized for uh, a, a bad decision. Uh, so so we, we do have the tools to help and working together, I'm sure we can do some great things. Thank you. Maybe Thank you, you could give us a contact uh, to the city manager. Uh, well, Don Act is here. He'll come up and speak. Good afternoon. Howdy. Well, happy to be here. What's your name? Uh, Don Ackley. I'm the water management supervisor for Coachella Valley Water District. You can substitute conservation for management. So it's conservation is what I do. Um, I, one thing, and I think they may have left. Uh, in our past ordinance, the one that we just passed last, last week, we have rescinded the restricted hour time on the sprinklers. You can now water basically 24-7. We strongly encourage people to water, you know, basically between sunrise and sunset. But, we, but we're not prohibiting it like we did before. So if your code enforcement people are driving down the street and see somebody with the sprinklers on, then um, we're not going to cite them for that. As far as, and I think it's, it's a great idea, about two hours bef before I left to come here, I was told by one of my staff people that um, uh, my boss and, and the people who run the turf conversion program uh, were, were discussing separating our program from yours, and anybody's, just because of this red tape. long it's entanglement red tape. and red tape <laughs> and, and uh, funding I issues, uh, but I think your idea, and I will pass this on to uh, uh, my director, my, that some arrangement where if they, if the city paid for them, 
then, then we would just automatically pay for them too. So that, that's going to have to be dis discussed. So uh, I guess I'll throw the question right back at you. Who should I have my director get in touch with? Right here, I'll, I'll Randall Binder, city manager, okay. water that's conservationist, it. and idealist. <laughs> that's quite. That's I'm sure fun. you know Heather Eng Engel, correct? Excuse me? You know Heather, Heather Engel? Yes, absolutely. Heather will be getting in touch with you Great. on this issue. Thank you very much. Look forward to working with her. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> One more thing. <laughs> we also have a rebate program for smart controllers. These are controllers that have weather sensors, sensors on them, and they self-adjust so people don't have to be reminded to go out and increase their water in the summer and decrease it in the winter. This all happens automatically, like just a few days back when we had that rainstorm and evapotranspiration rates or, or water use fell by uh, almost two-thirds. Then um, the clock senses that. And, and reduces the runtime at the same time. We install these, we give these clocks to our clients for free. Not only do we not charge for them, uh, we also install and program. It's probably the best deal in the state. Sure is. So uh, both the city and the city's residences can go on our website, cbwd.org and, and uh, drop down the, the bar that says conservation on it, and they'll have programs and rebates. And you'll see in there um, a smart controller or weather-based irrigation controller uh, application form. So strongly encourage both the city oh, itself great. and uh, your city's residents to take advantage of that program. That's a wonderful program. That's. Anybody who waters wonders every time when they see it raining and your sprinkler comes on, you just say, what do I do? And they, nobody knows what to do except let it happen. By the way, in the ordinance, if there's any, this is statewide and we've adopted it to any measurable rainfall, then you're prohibited to irrigate for 48 hours. Right. So that clock will help you out on that. We won't have to worry about that much with the amount of rain we've been getting lately, huh? Yeah. Well, my, my installers tell me, and this is also an extremely turns. popular program, but at, at, for some reason or another, the turf rebates got everybody's attention. They overlooked the clock. And the clock is the brains of the whole irrigation yeah. system uh, thing. So um, they're busy, too. Uh, they're, they're installing clocks. We've got two, three people pretty much installing clocks. But to uh, get a clock, two, three hundred dollar clock retail, uh, to get it for free and have somebody install it and go ahead and program it, you pretty much can't beat that deal. One question, why is it better to, if you're going to water your lawn one or two times, why is it better to do it between sunrise and sunset? Why not at night? Did I say sunrise? I meant to say sunset and sunrise. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Right. Maybe I heard it backwards. Yes. No, now, that, that's allowed now, but it's recommended basically to, to, to duck the high evaporation rates. Right. You do it at night. So basically same, after same 6 a.m. And, and the sun is way down setting, the, the plants aren't using very much water. And the same thing almost till 8, eight 9 o'clock. Uh, before the uh, sun's shining hard enough for the plants to start using water. But sunrise, to s sunset to sunrise is a uh, foolproof way of minimizing your application losses. Okay. Thank you I, again. One question. There was a gentleman that came here last week and spoke about a pumping system from the wat hot water heater to the showers. Uh, or to the faucet so you'd have instant hot water. We happen to have a yeah, circulation system. We happen to have one at our house so that we don't waste water waiting for water to warm up for a shower. Mm -hmm. And you just flick a switch and uh, you have instant hot water as you get in the shower. Is your company going to be uh, supplying any of that or looking into those kinds of programs? 
Pro not to my knowledge at this point in time, simply because the outdoor water use just absolutely dwarfs indoor water use. If you just skip one day's irrigation, you got a 14% reduction right there, and that's one of the first things that I tell people is, is that never on Sunday. Just do not irrigate on Sunday. Our soils have enough water holding capacity, even in the summer, to, to, to carry, to skip one day's irrigation. So if they've been irrigating seven days a week and now they irrigate six, there's a 14% reduction right there. And so much higher savings than that. What we recommend right now for people who, who have to uh, run their water uh, for quite a while is that they, they catch it in a bucket and, and use it, take it out to one of their trees or water their house plants. I did that several years ago. Yeah. <laughs> You still, you still have your bucket. Probably still, gets old after a while. I still have my bucket, but now I have a pumping system, so I don't need it. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Don, very much. And thank you, uh, sup what do they call you, director, uh, supervisor? Well, anyway, whatever it is, Mr. O'Dowd, thank you for being here. Uh, we have one comment coming from the audience. Mr. Mayor, thinks, can I have one he, thing while we're that he's got, down? because he's got a key to the city, he can speak whenever he wants. I just wanted to add one yeah, thing. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Well, hang on one second. Uh, stay right there. I hang just I just wanted to uh, talk about what Don spoke about. Uh, the city has put in smart irrigation controllers throughout our city. We're finishing up probably our last 20 or, or so. We have probably over, what, 80 or 90 controllers throughout the city? And we put in uh, Rainbird systems, and we're on a system right now where it adjusts, like what Don says, it's on a, um, it, it uh, receives information on a daily basis, and it tells it how much to water based on the previous day's evapotranspiration rate. So we've been doing that now for quite some time. And also, I, I got on a program with Desert Water Agency about five years ago when these smart controllers came out, and they came and programmed it, and we set it, and my water bill went down 26% in one year, just on the clock. So they, they are very effective. So that's something that somebody can immediately put in free of charge and see that kind of a savings. Do you, do you uh, water your yard or do we water our yards um, seven days a week? The Before it was watering seven days a week and it would adjust the amount of time it would water each day. Some days it would be um, more water because it was hotter out. Then if you got a cool spell, it would cut it down by two, three minutes per station. When the last rains came, it shut it off for two full days before it came on again. It didn't water for two full days. Um, but now I've got my clock um, set for only irrigating three days a week, and uh, that's based on the requirements of, of uh, desert water. But uh, these clocks are phenomenal. I think everybody should have one, and just make sure that gardeners don't touch them. And that's yeah, right. the problem. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Nichols, state your name and Mr. Mayor, city you live. Larry Nichols. Rancho Mirage, California, 92270. Two things I'd like to talk about. One is you gentlemen and Ms. Consman don't have to worry about people in your planning department. That gentleman sitting right over there named Jeremy handles this thing perfectly. I have been using it for the last year. I have 2,650 square feet of artificial lawn in my home. He's been the one that's helped me, but what this gentleman back here also has a great man in Renee of the water district. But the water district does say this. You have to go to the city first. They have, Jeremy has to put his stamp of approval on that. That gives us the $1,000 from the city. Then we have to take it to CBWD. They won't give you an application unless it's been marked off by the city, correct? Yeah, that's the way it curr currently works. That's we're going correct. to try to change that. That's what we're trying to change. Well, the money can come from you easily. If we get it stamped off by Jeremy, that's fine. But they also get another $1,000 if they go to CBWD. But right. they have to take the application from the city to CBWD to get that approval. And we do in Versailles. We're going for desert landscaping throughout. We'll be coming to the city again from the HOA. We're going to go complete desert landscaping along our outside walls. We're turning all of retention basins in to desert landscape instead of grass. And I've authorized all my homeowners. I'm president of the association in Versailles. I've authorized all my homeowners. They have a parkway between the sidewalk and the street. They can take that turf out 
and put in River Rock so that we lose that water just goes on a foot and a half and it just runs down the street. And as you know, any HOA has to have their own retention basins. We can't dump into the city sewer. So we have 16 of them. We have to take them and pump them out just like you do in a, in a, a septic tank. So if we can cut that water down and we're cutting it down in our community, but as far as the getting the, the process is, Jeremy handles it beautifully and so does Renee at the water district. So anybody that wants to get turf removal, they can get it easily. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to speak on this subject before we leave it? And we've just left it. Uh, okay, so we, um, Randy, sh should we just uh, put the matter over for further discussion? At, uh, what do you want? At what date or meeting would you like? How much time do you want? Well, uh, we might be able to have something ready in a couple of weeks, but I'll just, how about if I just put it back on the agenda after I talk with uh, okay. Heather Engel at the Water District. I think I have clear direction. We understand what we need to be able to do to implement the city's program independently okay. and hope that the work with the Water District to make sure that our requirements satisfy their requirements so it's not a double, double bureaucracy situation. Randy, but, uh, on one of the uh, pages of the report you guys put together, page 10-12, there's a whole list of items that consumers can use to meet their 36% target. And just a couple that were mentioned here, the uh, controllers and the turf removal. It might be worthwhile to consider doing some sort of a mailer Sure. A, a card like we can do to all the residents and listing some of these areas that would be easy for them to reduce their water usage. And that way we'd get to everybody. I mean, the door hanger is great, but to go out and put door hangers on everybody in the city would be impossible. But if we could do a card mailer uh, and not only once we approve the uh, the turf program for the city, we could also maybe refer to the water district program too. Great. But, but I think something like that would really approach the issue right now. And I think one additional way of reaching our public is by our e-blasting that we do from the city. And also, if the water district has any kind of videos or slide presentations, perhaps we can have uh, our library put it on our Rancho Mirage television. So it can be an educational program that can be uh, seen four times a day. Well, Jeremy, you can look into that as well. I'm sure. Where'd Jeremy go? Anyway, wherever Jeremy is, <laughs> by osmosis, he will have learned what I just asked. Right. Now, Mr. Mayor, one other thing. <clears throat> on, the, uh, on May 30th, uh, Mission Hills uh, is taking a very proactive role. <clears throat> and on the 30th, uh, it's a Saturday from 2 to 4. Uh, they are forming a Mission Hills Water Summit. Actually, I'm on the long-range planning for Mission Hills, and they're, it's open to anyone. <clears throat> and they will have a representative of CBWD, the city, uh, a conservation task force. And I think this will be the sort of thing that's imperative for all HOAs to develop. So for anybody that is interested, uh, this will be on the 30th, a Saturday, 2 to 4. Thank you very much, uh, Ted. Okay, well then without objection, uh, the matter will be received and uh, put back on a subsequent calendar as soon as uh, Randy's ready. Great, thank you okay. very much, Mr. Mayor. We'll move now to the final item on the agenda today. Uh, <clears throat> I gather this will be Britt Wilson discussing this. Yes, uh, thank you, yes. Mr. Mayor and Honorable Council. Make this very brief, and then I'll, if there's questions, I'll expound upon it. The Melarus Community Facilities District Act was adopted in 1982. It allows cities to impose special taxes. Uh, in accordance with that, in 1990, the city established its Community Facilities District Number 1 for police and fire services. And since that time, we've been annexing residential and commercial projects into that di original district. This would be annexation number 164. Mm -hmm. It's for the new Jaguar Rancho Mirage, the Desert European Motors Group. Um, it's, it's approximately two acres. There's a 13,425 square foot building. So the uh, 
annual amount of CFD coming in would be 7,518. And sorry, Isaiah, the staff report says you were going to get 49,000, but you're not. You're only going to get 78. So I apologize. I had a clerical error there that Isaiah pointed out to me, but uh, it will generate that much income. Uh, the steps in this process, this is the newly adopted or newly designed process by the city attorney. Uh, you will accept the petitions submitted by the Desert European Motors Group, which is attached to the staff report. You're going to accept uh, or consider accepting in the, and preliminarily approve the annexation map, direct the city clerk to record it, and then you would adopt the proposed resolution of intention to annex the territory to the district. This will all come back to you for its uh, next and, and last phase on June 18th when you've formally adopted after the vote is taken. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I will turn it back to you and um, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh I'll say that again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilson. Um, are there any questions uh, of staff by council? Anybody in the audience like to ask any questions or make any comments about this matter? Seeing none, we'll close it. Can we have a motion to accept all three motions at one time? Second. Okay, the motion is to accept the language of the three motions as stated in the staff report. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please vote aye. And those opposed? Vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. We'll now go into closed session after our city attorney tells us why. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, can I make an announcement about Memorial Day? There's going to be a Memorial Day um, ceremony um, on the corner of Duval and Ramon at um, Memorial Park, Desert Memorial Park. It's going to start at 9 a.m. I'll be the MC, so come. It'll be fun. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, so it's, that's on Monday. We do that every year. Um, so now we're going to recess into closed session to confer with legal counsel. going to confer with legal counsel pursuant to government code section 54956.9 regarding the case known as Veronica Juarez versus the city of Rancho Mirage. The council will also confer with legal counsel pursuant to government, government code section 54956.9D4 regarding three potential cases. Thank you. We stand in recess.